In this lecture, we're looking at Luther and Melanchthon, two of the most important figures in the Lutheran Reformation who create something of a microcosm of not only what Luther was attempting to do in Wittenberg, but also of the ensuing controversies within Lutheranism over the issues of justification and the will that will have a long-term impact on the shape of Lutheran theology after Luther's death. And the relationship between Melanchthon and Luther was complex. The two were the closest of friends on most every point. Not only that, but Melanchthon becomes really the systematizer of Luther's doctrines in the first two decades of the Reformation there. We've commented at a few points about how Luther was not very systematic in his explanation of things, how he was more anecdotal, or he wrote timely pieces based on the needs of the moment. And that, of course, has created quite a conundrum for later historians and theologians as they attempt to understand what Luther's doctrines were in some places. Well, Melanchthon is really the systematizer of Luther's thought, and some of the slogans that we associate with Luther, and some of the vocabulary that we use to describe Luther's theology, actually comes from Melanchthon. But, as we'll see in this lecture, Luther and Melanchthon did not agree on everything, and as the years wore on, Melanchthon's views drifted further away from Luther, and more towards a theology that was a mix between that of Erasmus and of the Reformed or Calvinistic movement. And we can begin by telling the story of Melanchthon and how he arrived in Wittenborg. Melanchthon was born on February 16, 1497, and he's born into a really well-educated family. His birth name was actually not Melanchthon, but actually a German name, Schwarzerd. It's a name that means Black Earth, and it's some indication that his family was, in a distant memory, people who worked in the soil, people who worked as farmers. Well, Schwarzerd was not a name that was very elegant, at least according to the standards of Latin. And so later in life, Melanchthon, like a number of others, changed his name by Latinizing it. And so Philip Melanchthon is actually Philip Black Earth. It's the same name in Latin, but it just sounds a little bit more elegant than Schwarzerd. And in 1507, Melanchthon, like all other boys who were being educated in this day, was sent to Latin school. And it's during his education that it's discovered that Melanchthon really is something of a savant. He's brilliant at languages and at his writing. And as we'll see in a bit, he actually is one of the youngest writers in the entirety of the Reformation. Well, Melanchthon's family, again, as I said, comes from a well-educated stock. His great-uncle was Reuchlin. Now, Reuchlin was one of the principal humanists of the northern part of Europe. He wasn't at the stature of Erasmus but he was certainly up there. And Reuchlin had become embroiled in a somewhat silly controversy by modern standards in which he had attempted to learn the language of Hebrew in order to study the Bible more effectively. And according to the canons of the day, the study of Hebrew was somewhat suspicious, according to the Catholic Church. And so Reuchlin came under fire by those in the establishment and by those in the more conservative theology faculties around Europe for his dabbling in Hebrew. It was believed that the Latin Vulgate was sufficient, and so the study of Hebrew was believed to be some attempt to undermine the Vulgate and perhaps to challenge Catholic teaching. And this controversy really signals some of the challenges that were faced in the years just prior to the Reformation. Humanists were often under fire for their attempt to get behind the Latin or to go back to an ancient past, to the fount or ad fontis as their slogan was. Well, Reuchlin becomes one of the more celebrated controversies over this issue because here was a man who was attempting to understand the Bible and to understand it in the original, and he was being attacked for this. And Reuchlin himself never really gets involved in the Reformation fully. He's a bit old by this point, but nevertheless, he does instill in his family, and this trickles down to Melanchthon, the desire to understand the original languages, as well as an unwillingness to listen to the Catholic Church whenever it sounded crazy whenever it wouldn't let someone go after the scriptures in their original languages. Well, in 1509, at Reuchlin's insistence, Melanchthon travels to the city of Heidelberg, where he enrolls in the university. Now note the age, he's only 12 at this point. He is attending university at a relatively early age, and he does pretty well there. However, in 1512, when Melanchthon had done all that was expected of him in order to receive an M.A., the university actually refused this M.A. for him on the grounds that he was too young. He was, after all, only 15, and to be declared a master 
which would open up the avenues for teaching herself, at such a young age seemed a bit too much or too radical. Anselm Melanchthon moves to the University of Tübingen, where he continues his education. Now, all during this time, throughout the 15-teens, Melanchthon is already beginning to write. In 1514, we know that he wrote a preface to the Book of Romans. And in 1516, he took his degree in theology, during which time he compiled and edited an edition of the works of Terence, one of the great classic Latin works of the ancient world. And then in 1518, a year after the 95 Theses controversy erupts, Melanchthon actually publishes a Greek grammar, already such a master of Greek that he's writing a grammar for it. And so it goes without saying that Melanchthon is a savant. He really is a genius. He knows his languages and he knows the classics, and he's even studied deeply in the subjects of theology. Well, it's at this point, after the Reformation has gotten underway, that Roycklin actually encourages Melanchthon to take a post at the University of Wittenborg. You see, at this point, in 1518, Roycklin and a number of other humanists often had trouble distinguishing between Luther and his protests, and some of the similar criticisms that you find in humanist circles around this same time. Roycklin seems a bit enamored by Luther. Here is a man who has stood up to the church, and since Roycklin has suffered some of the barbs of the church for his humanist studies as well, he feels that Wittenborg is a good place for his great nephew to work. And Melanchthon arrives, and he and Luther begin a partnership and a friendship that lasts all the way until Luther's death. And we've said how, again, Luther is not very systematic in his writing. The same is not to be said for Melanchthon. Melanchthon actually is the great systematician of the Lutheran perspective. Because in 1521, Melanchthon wrote a book that has gone down as one of the most important books of the entirety of the Reformation, and certainly the first great book of the Lutheran Reformation in terms of its systematic edge. And that book was the Loci Communes. And the translation of this is somewhat difficult. Loci, or sort of chapter headings, or big, broad subjects. And communes just means common. So sometimes this is translated to mean common places, or the principal places, which frankly translates probably in modern lingo to mean systematic theology, at least the way systematic theology has been written typically, which is, you know, you have chapters or subject headings, and then the author describes all the subjects that he wants to, under the heading of that topic. Well, this is exactly how Melanchthon has written this, which is why we call it a systematic theology. The loci communes are a codification and a rigorous structure of the ways in which we are to understand Luther's essential teachings and the teachings that are held there at Wittenborg. And it really is a masterstroke. It's Melanchthon, for example, who begins to talk about Luther's understanding of justification and of his preaching of it under the rubric of law and gospel. And there are other places where Melanchthon clarifies the essence of Luther's teachings on a subject in this book, as well as in other writings. And Luther really is astounded by the quality of the work of the Loci Communes. In many ways, Melanchthon helps Luther come to some vocabulary about his own theology. Now, it's not to say that Melanchthon changed Luther's position on anything, but rather in an effort to sum up or to simplify the language of what Luther was teaching, it was Melanchthon there as his right-hand man that helped Luther enormously to shape the language of the Lutheran faith. Similarly, in 1530, the Augsburg Confession, the great moment where this confession is laid before the Diet of the Holy Roman Empire and before Charles, and where the Lutheran Church is saying, this is our theology. Well, the Augsburg Confession was written almost entirely by Melanchthon himself. And it was Melanchthon, actually, at the Diet of Augsburg, who brought the confession, Luther himself staying back in Wittenborg for fear that he would be arrested and burned to death. So up until this point, the relationship between Luther and Melanchthon is pretty ironclad. They have enormous amount of respect for each other. Luther is somewhat the older brother, both in terms of age and obviously in terms of Luther's role in shaping the very vocabulary of the Lutheran Reformation. Melanchthon is not the man who is attempting to usurp or to overthrow Luther. He's not trying to create a church of Melanchthonianism. He's simply there to codify and be the right-hand wingman for Luther in the Reformation. However, after 1530, 
there arose some troubling things in Melanchthon's theology that have gone down all the way until today within Lutheran circles as problems that caused them to really doubt or in some cases reject entirely Melanchthon's role in the Lutheran Reformation. At some point after 1530, Melanchthon begins to change his position on two main points. First, sometime around 1530, Melanchthon begins to have some real serious trouble with Luther's understanding of the sacraments. Now, just to recap, we've looked at Luther at Marburg and the way he pounded the table at Zwingli saying, this is the body of the Lord. And later in this course, we're going to be looking at Luther's understanding of Christology in the sacraments more explicitly in an effort to understand what exactly he meant by that. But by this point, in the early 1530s, this is just after the Colloquy of Marburg. And Melanchthon has been reading the patristics for some time. He's really deeply read in the early language of the church fathers, the first four or five centuries of the church. And Melanchthon has been openly reading some of the reform tracts that are coming out of the Swiss regions. And it's around this time that personally, in some letters, he openly admits that he has some trouble with where Luther has come to this. Luther always insisted that when you take the bread, you are biting the physical flesh of Christ it must be physical. Now, he doesn't believe in the doctrine of transubstantiation in the Catholic sense, but he does believe in what we call physical eating. Well, after 1530, and as the Colloquy of Marburg and the aftermath of that sort of wear on, Melanchthon very quietly begins to drift more towards the Reformed perspective. Now, he doesn't go full Zwinglian, he doesn't go full spiritual presence, but he does admit that there are problems, he thinks, in Luther's theology of physical eating in the Eucharist. Well, that's strike one. <laughs> now, for some Lutherans, that's strike two and three as well. This idea that you would go back on Luther's understanding of the sacraments is really a betrayal, some feel, of the Luther gospel. More damning, though, or at least more problematic, is what happens up until roughly 1535. Sometime in this period, Melanchthon begins to develop language of what we call synergism. Now, synergism is a jargon word. It's distinguished on the one side from the opposite position, which is monergism. Now, these words are really not all that complex in terms of the theology involved. Monergism is just the Lutheran breakthrough. It's the idea that the will is bound, that there is nothing in us that provokes God to want to save us, no pre-works, no goodness in us by nature, that we are dead in our sins. And therefore, when God predestines and when he chooses and when he sends the Spirit into our hearts to take out the heart of stone and give us the heart of flesh and to cry, Abba, Father, that in the monergistic side, the key here is the prefix, mono, salvation is one direction. God only in his own will decides who he's going to save and the action and the decision is one-sided, you might say. It's God coming to save us, to regenerate us. Again, hopefully you can see that monergism is really a shorthand way of describing the entire complex of what Luther has said in his breakthrough in on the doctrine of justification by faith. Monergism just simply means Luther's understanding of justification, and we see that in books like The Freedom of the Christian Man, we see him defended against Erasmus and his bondage of the will, etc. Well, around this time, 1530 to 1535, Melanchthon begins to develop synergism as his perspective. The synergism, again, is, it's all in the prefix. The sin prefix, in a manner of speaking, means that there is a two-sided synergism. We even use the word today. There's a cooperation between us and God at the moment of salvation. And what Melanchthon means by this, and he first says it in a letter in the early 1530s, so it's a private affair. No one really knows that he's changing his positions on this. But Melanchthon begins to say that he actually finds something somewhat compelling about Erasmus's idea that there is some natural goodness in us, that God's predestination takes into account our good works or the things that are good and lovable in us, and so that God's predestination and God's salvation of sinners is somehow a cooperation between our good works and God's decision. And that is the classic definition of synergism. It's the idea that it's two-sided that there is some sense in which works are required, or that some natural goodness in us compels us to choose God at the same time he is choosing us. So Melanchthon, you might say, is not a strict predestinarian. 
On this issue, he becomes really closer to Erasmus, and frankly, this puts him out of step with just about every other Protestant reformer in the entirety of the 16th century. And it's for that reason, frankly, that Lutherans after Luther's death, and in some cases all the way down until today, have found Melanchthon's ideas and his synergism to be not just good-hearted, well-intentioned challenges to Luther, but rather a fundamental undermining of the very Reformation breakthrough itself. And it's at this point that we should remember our previous lecture on the antinomian controversy. Because if you'll remember, Agricola's concern was that Melanchthon was talking a whole lot about works. He was talking a great deal about the law. And Agricola comes along and says that it seems as if what Melanchthon is doing is championing again the law. And no one's quite made this connection, but it does seem to be tantalizing that Agricola really sort of has his finger on where Melanchthon is going with things before anyone else. Well into the 1540s and into the 1550s, there are a number of Lutherans who will attack Melanchthon's positions. But here is Agricola in 1536 and all the way up to 1540 when he is sort of exiled or he flees from Wittenborg for Berlin. Agricola is saying some of these things and his principal point of attack really is Melanchthon. I've always wondered, we'll never know, frankly. I've always wondered if Agricola had a more intuitive sense as to what Melanchthon was doing. Because we now know, according to private letters, that he's beginning to change his position on things. Well, Melanchthon does come out with this in 1535 in his second edition of the Loci Communas. In that book, he begins to add some synergistic language, some language of cooperation, and some language of good works as being necessary for the faith. Now, this is important because this is really about 12 years before Luther's death. Luther had plenty of time to read this, and if he would have read it, and if he'd had his barbs out, if he'd been ready to go to work on Melanchthon in a negative sense, he certainly would have had enough fodder for it. But it's something about Melanchthon and Luther's relationship that even though people came to Luther and warned him that Melanchthon had said some things that seemed out of step with Luther, there is some fundamental loyalty Luther has to Melanchthon, where he simply says, I will not believe that my partner has undermined or really substantively challenges anything of my message or my understanding of the scriptures. And this becomes important again for later Lutheranism. And even though we're not going to lecture on what happens so much after Luther, even though we'll talk a bit about his legacy at the end, you should know that what happens is after Luther's death, you have a split. You have people who become what are known as Philippists, that is to say, people who back Philip Melanchthon. And then on the other side, you have people that call themselves the Ganesio Lutherans, which is another way of saying that they are the true or the real Lutherans. And that fight carries on for some time and it shapes and it directs Lutheran theology, frankly, for the remainder of its existence, because eventually the fight is resolved in the formula of Concord in 1570, but the fights don't necessarily end there. Well, the wellspring of this, the headwaters of it, are that Luther and Melanchthon never really come to odds. They never have it out. I think it's not too controversial to say that if Melanchthon had been anybody else, Luther would have gone to task on him. However, because Melanchthon was his friend and his right-hand man, and he'd done so much for Luther during the course of the Wittenberg Reformation, that Luther somewhat gave him a pass or somewhat didn't want to go there. And so it became a problem of interpretation for later Lutherans to determine who was the real interpreter of the Lutheran message. Melanchthon had been there all along, and Luther had never cast him out, so maybe Melanchthon is the guy to listen to. But then again, just simply at the theological level, Melanchthon differed with Luther on two of the key points on the Lutheran message of the faith. In the end, though, Melanchthon is important for Luther and the Lutheran Reformation, not only in the context of its original formation, but also for the long history of Lutheran theology that would go on after Luther's death. Melanchthon is the great codifier of the Lutheran Reformation, and I always tell students, sometimes, if you really want to know what Luther had to say on something, go read the early stuff by Melanchthon. In particular, the 1521 Loci Communas is one of the clearest and the most accessible synopses of the Lutheran Reformation that was written during the entirety of Luther's life. Still, Melanchthon changed his stripes on a couple of key areas, and those key areas would become bones of contention for the Lutheran Church for some time. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to wrap up all of our sections on Luther with a look at his final years 
and then a look at the legacy of the man Martin Luther. Mm -hmm.